Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Challenger. At Challenger, we want to help you ensure that your retiree clients can meet their retirement needs today and tomorrow. To access thought leadership, insights, and tips on retirement planning for your clients, head on over to challenger.com.au forward slash XY. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm your host, Fraser Jack, and we are talking about the changing landscape of retirement. Uh, I'm joined by Rachel Lane, who I've spoken to a few times before, but uh, essentially Rachel uh, wrote wrote plenty of books about uh, about aged care, and she certainly knows what she's doing. She's uh, She runs a business called Aged Care Gurus. Welcome, Rachel. Hi, Fraser. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Now, uh, maybe we start with quickly just uh, a quick explanation of what Aged Care Gurus is. Sure. So, um, as you know, I came into uh, Aged Care Gurus having been a financial advisor and really set about building the tools and resources that I think advisors need to give great advice. And I guess one of the key differences with us is we kind of start with a very different definition of aged care. So our definition of aged care, unlike, I guess, the kind of normal definition of aged care, which is residential aged care facilities, uh, is really anywhere the client wants to, to live and any aged care service they want to receive. So we've built our software, the Aged Care Guru's Advice Builder, around exactly that. Do you want to stay at home? Do you want to move into a granny flat? Do you want to move into a retirement village? Do you want to move into a land lease community? Or do you want to move into residential aged care? And then what type of care are you going to receive? Are you going to receive, you know, home care packages? Are you going to receive private care? Are you going to get extra services with that? It's all really designed to be, I guess, aged care your way, you know, choose your own adventure of aged care if you like. And then we'd support that with a bunch of other resources. So um, fact sheets, statement of advice, wording, um, PowerPoint presentations, invitations to seminars, essentially anything we think that the advisors need. And we get feedback from our advisors regularly to say, could you do this? Uh, And we absolutely do. Because if I'm a big believer, if one person's asking, 10 people are thinking. Uh, And we, we also support them with monthly CPD webinars, um, roundtable discussions so that they can all, you know, get together and find out what other people are doing. So, yeah, that's that's basically what Aged Care Gurus is. Fantastic. Now, as you mentioned, there's plenty of options and opportunities for uh, retirees going into aged care. Um, but as we've spoken about before, if, uh, if there's no decision or choice or planning done in that space, then uh, then often they don't get that choice to that sort of the, um, it's the, the last resort they have, they have to get what they're given. Exactly. So, you know, I always say failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, And inevitably, uh, what you end up with is, and it's interesting to look at at clients who sort of do have two distinct groups. And unfortunately, um, the majority of clients are reactionary. So they they will plan when they absolutely can't avoid it any longer. Um, You do get those who are very... um, Active, they're, they're almost trying to um, create a preemptive strike. So they, they've likely seen a parent or a loved one go into residential aged care. They've decided that they absolutely do not want that for themselves or, or their partner or both. Uh, and they take active action to make sure that they set up their retirement in a way that gives them the best chance of not having to move to residential aged care in the future. But they are. Unfortunately, they are the minority of people seeking um, aged care advice. The majority of people seeking aged care advice um, are seeking it on behalf of someone else. That person may or may not have mental capacity to make those decisions. So often the decisions are 
uh, being made for them. So it's what I say, it's a very different experience. If somebody is doing this with you, that's a very different experience than when someone is doing this to you. Yes. So, yeah, it, it, it is quite quite different. And, and typically, it, it, you know, if you take that other larger group to the extreme, that person is in a hospital uh, bed because something has happened, a medical crisis has happened, and the person sitting in front of the advisor is the power of attorney uh, or the guardian, and they're being told, look, you've got two days, three days, and you need to have this sorted. Uh, and, and they're really operating in crisis mode. Yeah, so very, very big and important decisions with zero sort of lead in time and zero time to, to, um, to think about them uh, and really just have to make quick decisions. Yeah, uh, back when I was a financial advisor, I used to joke and say if I could just put a billboard in the hospital car park that says don't decide whether to keep or sell the family home here, you know, because oh. it seemed to me that those decisions were just literally being made in the hospital car park and that's not a great place and you're not in a great mind, you know, frame of mind to make the right decision or, or, you know, the best decision in that environment. No, there is no way. Like the emotion that's going through those <laughs> people at the time would cloud any decision. Yeah. Um, so so the, the big thing is here is to um, to have the conversation early, which obviously we've, we've, we know that from past behaviours, um, people are leaving it to the last minute or because they maybe they're fearful or they're, um, they just don't want to talk about it. What, what's the main reason? Oh, look, I, I think there's a combination of things and I don't discount that there's a significant cohort of people who have never sought financial advice. So because they haven't necessarily had a huge amount of wealth outside the family home, they haven't seen the need or the value um, in seeking financial advice and now they might be considering selling, you know, a million dollar property and they start going, well, hang on, if this is a million dollar investment decision, I do need financial advice. It's just that the trigger um, has been some sort of crisis or, or the fact that they, you know, I mean, the, the number of clients who seek advice when they've got a contract of sale on the home. And then they say, they say, oh, well, I better go and get advice now, now that I know how much my home's going to sell for and how much money I'm going to have, you know, in my pocket in 30 days' time, I better go and get advice. And back when I was a financial advisor, the number of clients, I would just shake my head and go, well, we, we can't unsell a house. And that was potentially the best strategy you had. You know? mm. Okay, so um, so what can planners do then if that's the case? Because I mean, it sounds to me like there's a there's a fair amount of education around that. You know, you, you're going to you, you as the retiree or 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 their clients uh, talking about their parents, whatever it might be, whether it's the actual um, you know, the retiree themselves or or the, their kids uh, as the client of the financial advisor. What can advisors do in this space to make the, their their clients more aware? Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think it is all about education. Um, I think it is all about clients or prospective clients learning those trigger points and saying, well, that means I need to get advice. I need to stop before I keep going down this road. I need to stop and get advice. And that's, that is really the motivation behind the, the books that I've written and the columns that I write for um, Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and, and people like that. It's really about getting that level of education through to consumers that um, you do have a smorgasbord of choices and that, that's, that's the great thing. You know, people always complain about the complexity, but the complexity comes from the smorgasbord of choices that you've got. So when you've got that many choices, you have to take on the responsibility to investigate those choices and to get great advice and work out which of those options is going to best suit you. Because, you know, when it comes to aged care, there, there isn't, a silver bullet. There isn't, you know, I think sometimes people think that, um, you know, there's a perfect solution or, you know, I, I think before the Royal Commission, everybody had some very strong held beliefs that weren't necessarily based on anything but assumption about residential aged care. So they thought that if, um, if you move into residential aged care, you're going to get more care than, than what you could get at home or that if you move into residential aged care, you're going to get better care than what you could in, in, a, in another environment or, or both. You're going to get both more and, and a higher quality of care. And I think what 
the Royal Commission has shown us is that that's not necessarily true. Um, and it really has shaken that, uh, that line or that kind of pinnacle of residential aged care being the, if you like, the ultimate care solution. Yeah, it's interesting when you mention the word assumptions because, you know, obviously people have an assumption based on a very narrow experience, often not many experiences, uh, one or two experiences, and then that's that's what they think of the whole system is, and uh, which I guess is very difficult from the education point of view when people come at it from so many different angles. Yeah, that's right. And and everyone does come in with their own their own idea of what aged care looks like. And unfortunately... Um, it may be shaped by bad life experiences. The other unfortunate shaping may be by the media and, and it may not be representative. You know, there's 1.3 million people receiving aged care services in this country and less than 200,000 of them live permanently in an aged care facility. You know, when, when people are talking to me about aged care, I can tell that they are the underlying assumption of what they're talking to me about is residential aged care. And, you know, I'd just love to grab that assumption and turn it upside down Mm. and say, listen, when we're talking about aged care and you're only talking about residential aged care, you're ignoring 80% of people who are receiving aged care services. Yeah, that's incredible. And you're right, the the media needs to make headlines. And of course, they've had plenty of headlines over the last sort of 12 months to be able to to point the finger at uh, at facilities and say they're doing a terrible job, Um, (laughs) where, where a lot of them might be doing a great job. Well, and some of, some of them have. There's no there's no doubt about it. Some of the stories, I know people have been working in aged care literally for decades, and they are shaken to their core over some of the stories that that have come out. It's certainly something that I haven't seen, um, and I don't know anyone personally who has experienced that. But the fact that someone has, it, it's completely unacceptable yeah absolutely and it's, it's very much uh similar to what the financial planners have been through in the past with regards to you know a few people doing the wrong thing and then everybody else getting uh getting tarred with that brush um i wanted to talk about the current the the industry as a whole at the moment because you know, we, we've had conversations around the profitability and the sustainability of the the, the system or the facilities themselves uh, and and what they're going to be expecting in the short term, and also in the long term, as the, as a bubble of baby boomers sort of hit aged care. We talked about the the sustainability. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I guess that's that's one of the greatest hopes coming out of the Royal Commission is that the industry will be sustainable. At the moment, you've got somewhere between you know depending on which figures you look at, but somewhere between forty and fifty percent of aged care facilities are operating at a loss. You've got this, you know, huge cohort, um, the the government call it the ageing population, you know, you and I call it the baby boomers, Fraser. Yep. (laughs) Um, But you've got this huge cohort of people that are going to want to access or need to access um, accommodation and care services. Uh, The government are estimating that the current 1.3 million people accessing aged care will grow to 3.5 million by 2050. So that's that's huge in terms of demand. And to put that in a context, there's roughly 200,000 residential aged care beds in the country at the moment, and we would need to add another 500,000 if we were to keep the current 20% of people receiving aged care, receiving that care in an aged care facility. So you look at that and you think, well, where, where are those 500,000 beds going to come from? Who, who in their right mind in terms of uh, an organisation, whether you're a church, charity, not-for-profit organisation or whether you're a for-profit organisation, who is going to build more aged care beds, more aged care facilities if on average you're making a loss? And and don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that everybody's making a loss or you know, you will find a greater proportion of aged care facilities making a loss in uh, rural and regional areas than you will in in metro areas. But it's an issue. How are they going to get 500,000 beds in that short a period of time if they can't sustain the current 200,000? Yeah, this, is, this seems absolutely crazy, the, 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 the growth that's required or, or needed in this space. Obviously, to me, straight away, that says supply and demand, that fees are going to have to go up and, and costs are going to have to go up in this space. That's where it becomes interesting because it's against the backdrop of the Royal Commission 
And the Royal Commission are recommending a, a whole range, 148 recommendations, but in terms of the financial arrangement, it's a complete revolution. So at the moment, to be a fully supported resident by the government, which means that you pay a basic daily fee, but the government cover your cost of accommodation and the cost of your care, you need to have assets below $171,535 and income below about $27,800 a year. So essentially what you're talking about there is the equivalent of a full pensioner with less than $171,500 of assessable assets. In the proposed new world, they're, they're saying, well, we don't want there to be any crossover between the age pension means testing arrangements and the aged care means testing arrangements, which means that potentially you're talking about someone with $797,500 of assets before they start contributing towards the cost of their aged care. That's, that's going to be very, very expensive to the taxpayer. So if you, and, and it's also going to, I mean, the pension is kind of the, the holy grail to so many retirees, but the desire to get and keep that age pension, if you can achieve that, then under these proposed reforms, you would have a cost of care that's only you know, 85% of the pension at the moment, $52.25 a day, even though you might have you know, $700,000 in assets <laughs> or close enough to $800,000 in assets. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear the numbers don't work. Um, is the pension actually, uh, do you see it going down as in um, the government's commitment towards it because of the superannuation environment and how well it's done over the past sort of 20, 30 years? Uh, I, I, I don't think the, for the most part, look, when, when you and I get to that point, Fraser, definitely, uh, but I don't see it. I, I, I can see that there will be a growing number uh, and certainly, you know, ABS statistics support that there will be a growing number of people receiving a part pension versus a full pension. But in terms of this idea that um, there won't be pensioners, that, the you know, it, it just doesn't stack up that that would be the case. Yeah. So so essentially, uh, if superannuation was started 30 years earlier, we might be okay. But the the, the problem we're going to have is, as you said, the three and a half million people by 2015 um, needing uh, aged care services and the fact that those people didn't really have a whole superannuation pot growing over you know, 40 years that to, to self-fund them. Exactly, you know, and, and there'll be a disparity in there, as we know, between men and women. So you'll have uh, women who will have far less uh, in superannuation than men because, you know, they, they stop their careers to have children and do all those sorts of things. So mm, Okay, so got some big, 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 uh, big problems coming down the, the track. Uh, the, as you mentioned... Well, the... sorry, the, the, the other issue that you've got is the workforce. So it's not like we can just look at, you know, the population of Australia and say, oh, the population is ageing, but think that that, that doesn't happen um, within the aged care workforce. You know, the aged care workforce are, are ageing as well. So you've got, you know, this kind of retirement of skills that, that's going, but you've also got this issue of how, I mean, we saw with COVID the issues that the sector had in staffing the aged care facilities um, and the fact that so much of the workforce is a casualised workforce and they work across multiple aged care facilities. That's the issue we've got now. So, you know, imagine what that issue looks like when there's an extra 500,000 aged care beds that, that require care to be delivered to them. And even imagine, Fraser, you know, we, we've got sort of a million people accessing care in the home. Imagine what that looks like when you've got 2.8 million people getting care in their home. The idea that we can have the current models that we've got, where we've got literally nurses driving door to door in the suburbs, I just don't think the workforce is going to be able to sustain that. I think what you'll find is they'll need to move to more of a, a hub type model um, and, and potentially, you know, they'll need to move to a retirement village, a, a land lease community, some form of um, community-based housing where those services can be delivered in a really uh, effective 
and you know economical way. Yeah, so just expand on that hub model a bit more because, I mean, uh, I live on the Gold Coast and there seems to be a fair few sort of now um, areas coming out where, um, you know, they're, they're advertising for over 50s, over 60s, over, you know, like those sorts of things. Are you talking about for the sort of that later stages of retirement where people are moving into um, a space more so where they're sort of semi, there's semi-care available but at, at a close range? Yeah, I, I think, look, the economies of scale that can be offered – by retirement villages, land lease communities, even, you know, strata title developments. I guess the issues you get with strata title is that there is no discrimination based on age. So you will get single, you know, young, single professional working people. You will get young families. You will, you know, you'll get a mixture of everybody, whereas retirement villages and land lease communities, I guess, are looking at the need for care, looking at their... Um, their residents and their prospective residents and they're building their buildings, whether they're freestanding homes, whether they're apartments, whether they're, you know, units, whatever they might be, with what I call care infrastructure. So you don't necessarily see it and certainly the majority of them don't look anything like an aged care facility. But, you know, there's nice wide corridors, um, for example, and and that just gives a sense of space. But when you know what you're looking at, you know that you're look the reason they've built it that wide is so that you can get, you know, one of those zippy frames to go up and down that corridor. And likewise, when they've got a very spacious kitchen, there's extra gap between the island bench and the and the back wall of the kitchen. You know that it it's for mobility related reasons. And and likewise the bathroom. They they don't necessarily have the grab rails you know, on display, but they've they've got the anchors in the wall so that if those grab rails are needed, and likewise, there's no, you know, there's no step to get into the bathroom. There's no recess on the shower. It's all very big and open, and you know, it looks like a hotel. Sometimes you even have a shower that you can access from both sides. It, it looks very much you know, like a luxury hotel. But in reality, a lot of those design choices are about the delivery of care, whether it's now or in the future. So I guess people, if they're, you know, a lot of people have that long held view, oh, you know, if I, if I need aged care, I'm going to get it in my own home. They discover that that's not necessarily safe. That's not necessarily practical. That's not necessarily affordable. Um, when that time comes, because they've never really looked at their, their home through those lenses. Yes, uh, yeah, I agree. And, um, and and we've sort of talked before about the concept of baby boomers when they come through having different expectations than what they, what they would have put their parents into. Absolutely. I mean, baby boomers have revolutionised everything they've touched. And um, I think, you know, retirement villages, the, the financial model has really been built on an exit fee. And it it came out of the, the church charity and not-for-profit organisations who built retirement villages uh, back in the 50s um, and they wanted to make it affordable. So really it's an affordable housing model. And what they did is they, they built these villages and they said, well, we'll charge you this amount up front and we'll charge you 30% later. That's basically um, how it worked. And then along the way, they just charge almost like a body corporate. There's a budget of expenses. They apportion the expenses. There's no profit in, in the running of the village in that way. So that's where, where that industry has come from. But I think the idea that you say to a baby boomer, look, retirement villages, you know, the birth of that industry, which may have occurred before your birth, um, is this financial model. Um, ergo, you're going to have to pay an exit fee because that's what's been accepted for the 70 years before you got here. Baby boomers will just say, well, why? Like, okay, I understand that's how you, you've always done it. But if I go and buy a new car, if I go and buy a mobile phone, if I, you know, uh, I, I have choices about the way in which I pay for that. Why would I be forced into paying an exit fee? Why, why are you forcing me to accept affordable housing when I don't need your affordable housing, thanks anyway. Hmm. Okay, and that comes back down to uh, when we do talk to people before they have to make the choice um, and, 
show them their options and then let them have a bit of a negotiation period rather than being forced into something. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I, I don't, th- I mean, some of the operators are already moving down that road and, and providing payment options, but by and large, the industry is still very, very wedded. And I do try and challenge their thinking on that from time to time. You know, when I speak at conferences and things like that, I say to them, imagine if you went down to BMW and you wanted to buy a car and imagine if the salesperson said to you, you you can buy this car, it's $80,000, but you can't buy it for $80,000. What you need to do is you need to pay me $50,000 today and $50,000 in five years' time. And the consumer would rightly say, but it's only worth $80,000 today. It's going to cost me $100,000 if I pay for it over five years. And the sales guy would say, oh, yes, but that's the value of our money over time. We, we need to be compensated because we're effectively letting you have the capital for that period of time. Everyone would be outraged. Everyone would say that is forced finance. You, you absolutely cannot do that. You cannot force somebody to borrow money from you and pay a premium uh, for the right to do that. And yet in retirement villages, um, because that's the origin of the, of the industry, and because they don't view it in that way, they don't view it as forced finance. And I think it's probably only because, you know, I and, you know, many of your listeners being financial advisors look at it and go, well, well hang on a minute, what's the difference between that and that? They, they just accept it. But the idea that baby boomers are going to just accept that and say, oh, okay, I'll pay an exit fee. No, I, I, I don't think so. That being said, I don't think exit fees will be removed completely. I think exit fees play a really important part uh, of helping people who otherwise couldn't afford to pay the full price up front. Um, but I think they should just be used for exactly that. They should be used for those who need it and not forced on those who don't because it just makes the transaction more expensive. Yeah, that's that's really well put, um, and and absolutely right. I think um, you know that you're you're right. The, the the models will have to change. Um, now we mentioned the Royal Commission. Obviously, 148 recommendations. <sighs> Who's going to pay for them all? <laughs> yeah, well, and that that is. Uh, I'd love to say that's the million dollar question, but I think the, <laughs> the answer not enough. to that is uh, it's closer to 25 billion dollar question. Um, look, there there was talk about a levy. Um, there were a couple of different models um, that were proposed. So one of the interesting things about the Royal Commission's report was that the commissioners didn't necessarily agree on everything. Uh, and so in some cases you have, um, you know, a divergence of views about how these things would happen. And certainly when it came to um, the aged care levy, the commissioners agreed that a, a levy would be necessary to fund um, the improvements and the freeing up of aged care services, uh, but they didn't necessarily agree on how that levy would work. And Josh Frydenberg has kind of come out and said, well, we're not really sure that there will be a levy because the, the levy did receive a lot of media attention and um, a lot of people were very, very concerned about what that would what that would mean. You know, potentially you would be increasing the top marginal tax rate by 5%. That means you're taking the top marginal tax rate over 50%. It's, it's a pretty expensive exercise for, for taxpayers. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure that we've got the right um, balance within the proposed reforms around means testing um, and, and user contributions versus what the government, at ergo the taxpayer, um, will need to pay for. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. You, you're, you're not sure, and neither are the commissioners. So, uh, which you'll, which no matter which means no matter what they do or say, um, there will be somebody disagreeing. So it'll be uh, tough to get uh, reforms through. You know, when it comes to these proposed, you know, new means testing arrangements, there's a significant change to how the the former home would be treated. At the moment, the former home is included in someone's aged care assets. Um, unless a protected person lives there. If a protected person lives there, it's exempt. Uh, and if it's included in your assets, it's included up to 
odd dollars. What the um, Aged Care Royal Commission is saying is, well, they want those rules to also marry with pension rules. So what that would do is, at the moment, the definition of a protected person includes, you know, a spouse or dependent child, a carer who's been living in the home for the last two years, who's eligible for an Australian income support payment, or a close relative who's been living there for the last five years, who's eligible for an Australian income support payment. So what this change would mean would be, because pension means testing has no concept of a protected person other than your spouse. So the only protected person would be your spouse. And then what they're saying is, well, for two years from the day you or your spouse move out of the home, same as pension, the home would be exempt. And then beyond that, it would be included um, up to the market value. So there's potentially going to be winners and losers. Um, and there's always winners and losers when they make big changes like this. Um, but I guess my concern really revolves around those people who currently meet that criteria um, of a protected person, you know, those carers, those, those close relatives um, who are living in that home and what this change to these rules means for you know, wh- where they're going to live. Yeah, I think and, and even what, what arrangements people kind of are, are willing to get into knowing that this is how the home would be assessed if that person was to subsequently move into residential aged care. Yeah, the protected person thing to me sounds pretty um, like it needs to have more consultation or conversation around it because, you know, the, 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 the requirements for people and hands of people to help um, is sort of being cut here. Yeah, that's right. We already know that the heavy lifting when it comes to care is done by what what the government call informal carers, which overwhelmingly is family. So the idea that we would remove these rules um, and make it harder as a society for us to to get those people to do that um, and and therefore place greater strain um, on the formal workforce, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. With regards to um, the main changes out of, out of the Royal Commission, what, what, how would you summarise that? What are the main things that are coming out of it? Uh, well, obviously with 148 recommendations, there's potentially a lot. But look, I, I, I want to make the point that I, I don't think whether the commissioners agreed on everything and, and presented to the government 148 recommendations that were a completely united view that the government would would pick that up and implement every recommendation. So I'm not sure that having a divergence of opinions um, around certain elements is necessarily a bad thing. I think sometimes sometimes you can get a better outcome by saying, well, we could do it this way or we could do it that way. I think if you just give one option to the government and say, well, this is how to do it, it's easy to say no. Whereas if you say, well, you could do it this way or you could do it that way, much harder to say no because now you've got an option. So, look, some of the interesting things uh, around the, the proposed reforms are the, the change to the means testing arrangements, which would basically mean that if somebody could get and hang on to uh, an age pension, they would only um, only contribute fifty two dollars a day towards the cost of their residential aged care. Some of the the recommendations that I was really excited about were changing the funding for aged care so that the funding available in residential aged care uh, is also ab- available in home care. So removing at the moment um, there can be a gap of between residential aged care funding and home care funding, and, and it can go both ways. So there there can be circumstances where uh, in home care, the person can receive significantly less funding for their care than what would be available to a residential aged care facility if that person chose to move into the aged care facility. But likewise, you can have the opposite. You can have someone getting a home care package, particularly if they've got dementia or, um, you know, cognition-related care needs, and the funding for those care needs through the home care package is greater than what the government would fund if they had those same care needs in a residential aged care facility. So, you know, it it was part of our submission to the Royal Commission that there were these anomalies and and it didn't really make a lot of sense that the amount of funding available for someone's care was different based on where they lived. So I'm really excited that, that that's being removed. I'm really excited that aged care is 
basically being moved from a rationed based system. So people often think of aged care as like Medicare. If you need it, you get it. It's not going to take very long to get it. Um, it, it doesn't work like that at the moment. It's basically a budget of money and they apportion that budget of money across the services from home care services to residential aged care services with residential aged care services getting the, the lion's share of the funding. Uh, and that's it. And, and the result of that rationing is exactly what we see with the, the home care package waiting list. You know, um, there's roughly 100,000 people waiting for a home care package. And the, the Royal Commission took evidence that, you know, it's estimated about 16,000 people a year die waiting for their home care package. Um, and, and certainly there were stories of people waiting 34 months for their home care package to start. I mean, it's, I guess, the, the reality of the system versus people's perceptions it's you know it's black and white people have an expectation oh if if I say to my GP that I need some help around you know to stay at home and I need a little bit of aged care uh, on Monday someone's going to come and they're going to force me to get uh, the reality of the system is is the complete opposite of that mm. you know people think it's going to move quickly it's yeah it's it's just yeah, this, this waiting list is staggering, the fact that, you, as you said, 100,000 people are on the waiting list and, and 16,000 a year dying is, you know, imagine if we put some effort into changing that, like the amount of effort we put into, um, you know, stopping the spread of COVID around the country. Uh, it seems to me that um, that that's a bit of a no-brainer. We need to, to make fix that up. Now, um, the, the, the package, the home care package waiting list is um, in the recommendations to be scrapped. Is that right? Yeah, so they, they want that, that waiting list to be cleared um, as a matter of urgency. So this year, um, of course, saying that and doing that are, are two different things and there is that workforce issue now. Um, so they, they would need to address, well, where's the workforce going to come from to, to deliver these services? Uh, but I think it's important because fundamentally until they can do that, what choice do people really have when it comes to aged care? So unless they are, like we were talking about at the start, unless they are in that group of people who are really proactive, who understand that the system doesn't work the way most people think it works, um, and they get involved early um, because they have that motivation of making that preemptive strike against having to move into residential aged care, the overwhelming majority of people are, are not in that group. They're, they're kind of making decisions at the very last minute. So if you're you know, making a decision today, oh, okay, I better start accepting some care. And let's say you need a level three home care package. How, how is it possible? I mean, with I guess that's where the informal carers come in, you know, the families, the, the friends, the, you know, communities, volunteers, all of that come in to try and help you to do that. Um, but for a lot of people, it will just mean that they need to move into residential aged care, even though that is not their choice. Mm. Uh, now, we, we talked about this um, before having the choice and, you know, making decisions early. Um, and I know you've got a book around the concept of, you know, downsizing or, or um, right-sizing homes. Uh, Australians do have a lot of their money tied up in their homes. How, how do you see this playing out and, and what can a planners do about um talking to their clients earlier or helping them with the, the, the concept around their, you know, the, the, the asset of their family home? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the home is the biggest investment for, for most Australians, financially speaking, but the home is also the biggest investment in terms of, you know, where you live um, has been shown to be the greatest indicator of how happy you're going to be, how long you're going to live, all sorts of health-related and data comes out about the home. So the home is integral. Like I, I would actually say that when it comes to um, retirement and aged care planning, the number one question that needs to be asked is where do you want to live? And everything revolves around that. Um, I, I know from our point of view, the first question um, that we ask um, in the software is where, where will the client live? Because it really does impact on so much. 
So I think people, especially the baby boomers, will will look at their home a little bit differently to the generations that that came before them. Certainly um, baby boomers have been more inclined to move home um, and so moving again won't be as big of a, a, a deal. Um, I think the challenge will be for the downsizing options, you know, the retirement villages, the, the granny flats, the land lease communities, um, the community housing groups. It, it will be for those guys to build a form of accommodation um, and, and plug in the services that that cohort want. And I think what you'll find is that their, their needs will, will be quite different to, to anyone who's come before them, but also that you will have a lot more, if you like, subgroups and, and different lifestyles that people are, are searching for um, and, and therefore will, will demand certain, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, it almost feels like now's the time when we need to start really forming, I don't know if it's a government in, uh, initiative, but uh, groups around this this plan to build these facilities and, and start creating these facilities and, you know, in, in areas and understanding from a national point of view what, what that might look like. Yeah, and I think, look, I, I've spoken to people who've created um, co-housing arrangements with friends. Um, I've heard my mum and her friends talk about doing similar, you know, they, they look at retirement villages and go, oh, you know, uh, because they, they see what's there at the moment and they say, well, that's not what I want. You know, so they say, oh, well, why don't we get, you know, six couples and we'll build six houses and we'll have a central courtyard and a swimming pool and a barbecue and we'll get a chef to come in and cook our meals and we'll get a cleaner and they can clean our houses and if we need care, we can share that, you know, that care provider. And it's not necessarily a bad concept but it's fraught with a lot of risks and a lot of dangers and, you know, it, it kind of, it, it sounds good in theory, but in reality, and, and I think that's the thing, the, the providers, you know, the, if you like, the official providers um, of retirement villages need to meet those expectations. And, and I'm not just talking about that particular set of expectations. There'll be other people who have, you know, completely different expectations around what they, you know, they may be um, very much wanting something that is green and energy efficient and sharing cars and, and you know, and those exist as well. Um, and, and, you know, all sorts of other, you know, one's built on golf courses, one's built on marine, you know, there's lots and lots of different lifestyles that that, that can be provided. But really, that will be the challenge for the official providers of retirement villages to meet those people's needs because the baby boomers are, they are organised, they are innovative uh, and they will, if they can't find what they want in the marketplace, they will go and, and make their own. Yes, I can see developers all around the country starting to think about this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel, for coming and having a chat to us today about the, all the different many changes and obviously there's a, there's a stack of them going on and there's, there's you know, another 140 we didn't cover um, out of the Royal <laughs> Commission. Um, probably could be here all day on that, but uh, I guess it's an interesting space and obviously, um, as we mentioned before, the numbers don't quite work, so it's going to be very interesting to see how all this pans out over the, uh, the next little while. Yeah, it, it, it is a great space and I think obviously I, I have a passion for it and I know a number of financial advisors out there share that passion and the thing is that great aged care advice can make such a difference and it's like any kind of great advice, right? It, the difference is not just about the numbers. Don't get me wrong, the numbers are important and, and the advice needs to, to stack up and be valuable financially but, but great aged care advice um, is about so much more than that. You know, it's really about honouring what that person wants for their aged care um, and and finding a way for them to to afford that. Um, and I just think, you know, giving giving great advice in this space is, is really rewarding for the advisors, um, but I know that the clients get so much more bang for their buck than, than just the financial outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the big call to action here is to plan early, uh, educate well, um, educate your clients well, plan, help them plan early so that they have those choices to make um, and rather than being just, you know, left with what they what they have to do at the last minute. So 
Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for chatting with us. How can people continue the conversation with you if they want to reach out? Well, we're in the Twitter sphere. If they would like to contact us on Twitter, we're on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course, uh, our website, which is just hkgurus.com.au. Uh, and yeah, any way people want to get in touch, feel free. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the XY Advisor podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and I'm here hanging out with Emily Blanche. G'day, Emily. Oh, yeah. Hey, Fraser. And we are chatting all things, but uh, specifically, we want to knuckle down the conversation around a shout out on this episode. Awesome. My favorite time of the week. So shout out today goes to XY Advisor Grant Miller from the sunny Gold Coast. So earlier this week, we launched the new resources center on the platform. Now, this place is chock-a-block full of advisor-shared documents, templates, resources, IP, and Grant saw that a couple of cash flow calculators had been shared. So he jumped in and then shared his as well. And as far as I'm concerned, you can never have too many. It's a way for advisors to not have to reinvent the wheel. They can jump in, take ideas and inspiration and see how others have done things in their business. So just wanted to say a massive thank you, Grant, for jumping in and sharing yours. To anyone else who is yet to jump in there, go and check out the Resources Center. And if you have something that you can contribute and add, it all helps in driving the positive evolution of financial advice. And I know everyone will be super appreciative of it. So thanks, Grant. Thanks, Grant.